الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله We are currently more than halfway through our rebuttal of the Hizb tahrir and have been saving the best till last. But the Hizb has already become unsettled. The tree has been shook and it's been shook hard. HD Australia and HD UK have chimed in in support of HD Canada. They've been spamming us with one of several written responses without waiting to see all the evidence, the most damning evidence against them. Considering how illustrative of their confusion it is, we're breaking from the scheduled series uploads in order to first address said response. Which will be read out by me in lieu of HT. Bismillah. My response to more lies and anti Khilafah Saudi state propaganda being produced by these super Salafis. Where is this phantom Saudi state anti Khilafah production you smear us with? Give us one single such resource we have taken from. Just one. You can't because it don't exist. Don't get me wrong. State-sanctioned propaganda is real, as we saw recently with Ikhbariya Gate. We'll be dropping an episode on that scandal soon. But as for our presentation on all matters caliphal, all the scholarly authorities we appeal to passed away well before Saudi Arabia was even a thing. HT are just throwing dirt in the hope some of it will stick. Our position on the Khilafah is normative, orthodox, mainstream, aka Sunni. Muslims from America to Africa to Australasia, across all schools of thought, even those with whom we differ on the finer details of what does and does not constitute Tawheed and Shirk. That includes blasphemy as well. We all share the same basic conception of the Khilafah and its return, an understanding we have inherited from the caliphates of the companions of Allah's Messenger and their children, which were witnessed in the first 50 years of Islam. HT's understanding of the Khilafah, by contrast, was invented only within the last 50 or so years by their founder, Taqiyuddin and Nabahani. And this understanding of theirs is not found anywhere outside their jama'at, except with some takfiri jihadis. As for the term Super Salafi, it was coined by Sheikh Muhammad Jabali in 2003 to describe a group who had gained notoriety for hunting their brothers' mistakes and testing them with personalities and other such unpleasant, un-Islamic behaviour. The same group who would go on to be called Madkhalis. If you were to ask Sheikh Jabali about HT, he'd have told you they are thousands of times worse than those Super Salafis whom he criticised. At least those supers are still within the fold of Ahl Sunnah, despite their paddling in a muddy puddle of innovation. Muddy puddles! HT, by contrast, do not even ascribe themselves to Ahl Sunnah and are drowning in an ocean of innovation. The first issue in the video is the use of the term Islamic Caliphate. Like there can be such a thing as a non Islamic Caliphate. The Khilafah in origin is the Islamic ruling system. It is in no need of an adjective to describe itself as Islamic. By definition, it is the Islamic ruling system. Tautology is not a sin. Mosques are also by definition Islamic. Yet Allah described the mosque built upon falsehood to oppose the Jama'ah of the Muslims with a less than complimentary adjective. Masjid Dirar, the Mosque of Harm. Similarly, Prefixing caliphate with an Islamic adjective may be unnecessary, but it's hardly misguided, especially if you consider the distinction that was being made between a caliphate upon the prophetic methodology and one upon the contrived, innovated methodology. Was the caliphate of Daesh stroke ISIS Islamic or un-Islamic? The Qadiani stroke Ahmadis also claim to have a caliph. Is that in line with Islam or outside of Islam? Likewise, HT's conception of the caliphate is contrived and their methodology for establishing it unsuccessful and un-Islamic. For the political establishment of the Khilafah. This shows the presenter's ignorance of the Islamic ruling system. There is no such thing as a Khilafah ruling system. This idea of systems was invented by HT's founder due to what appears to have been an inferiority complex vis-à-vis the former European colonial powers. They have socio-economic ideologies, 
capitalism and communism. So we have to redefine Islam as a rival socio-economic political ideology too. They have constitutions, so we need a counter-constitution. They have systems, so we need to reinterpret Islam also as a bunch of systems. You've got to have a system, haven't you? No. What we have in Islam is the Sharia, principles and guidance rooted in the Book and the Sunnah by which the believers, individually and collectively, conduct their public and private lives. Enough of this systems malarkey already. By definition, the establishment of a ruling system is political. Saying political establishment implies there may be a non-political establishment of the Khilafah. Is there a non-political establishment of the Khilafah? Well, yes. If you want to argue on semantics, the only establishment of Khilafah we find referenced in the Revelation was via direct divine intervention, not a premeditated political campaign. This has already been covered at some length in Volume 2. As said, at worst, the bro, my podcast host, may have been guilty of tautology. But as we've now seen, there was actually merit in distinguishing between orthodox understandings of Islamic terms from the heterodox misunderstandings of Hizb tahrir Work to establish the Deen of Islam. Without a Khilafah, that statement neglects various verses of the Quran and Sahih Hadith of the Prophet. Because HD do not have a practical working conception of Islam outside the Khilafah, that is, they do not believe in religiosity, they consider non-caliphate-centric religious expression and religious practice as diversionary neglect. Islam enjoins obedience to Allah in what is required of us whether a Khilafah exists or not. That's the Sunnah. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, did not forego the worship of Allah, nor inviting to his worship until Allah granted him a state. Rather, that state, Medina, was granted to him in direct response and as reward for his ibadah and establishing the Dawah to Tawheed in Mecca and beyond. We've repeated this multiple times. Perchance it may eventually sink in. Lipam also said, Not rushing to try and force our will above Allah's will, Man is not capable of enforcing his will over the will of Allah. Nothing happens except by the will and permission of Allah. Even our free will is contingent on the will of Allah. Okay, what do we understand from the ayah? And you will not will except as Allah wills, Lord of the worlds. That no matter what man intends and desires, it is Allah's will that will be done. Similarly, if Allah has promised to establish the believers upon the earth, should they fulfill his commands, then HT's communism-inspired revolution will not be able to supersede his will. The Khilafah is a Sharia rule, not a gift. Salah, Psalm, Hajj, Zakah are likewise Sharia rules. The idea of it being a gift is most likely based on a mistranslation of Surah 24 verse 55. But the ayah is evidence to the contrary of Allah's distinguishing between the Khilafah and Sharia rules. He subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us here, Believe in me and evidence that belief with righteous deeds that I may establish you in the land. What are those righteous deeds? Are they not the fara'id first and foremost? the obligatory pillars of Salah, Som, Zakah and Hajj, as the following ayah emphasizes. And perform the prayer, and pay the arms, and obey the messenger, that you may receive mercy. Khilafa is not and never was an obligation upon the average Muslim. Whereas Salah, Zakah, Psalm and Hajj were and are. Compelling each and every believer with the caliphate is a, may be the defining bidah of Nabahani. May Allah forgive him. One of several despicable innovations that he invented into the religion of Islam when he founded the cult that is Hizb tahrir Establishing a unitary Islamic state is only an obligation upon those who are able and liable. The Ahlul Halli Wal Aqd, the people of power and influence. Had it been an obligation upon every Muslim, then Allah would have clearly revealed so in his book and upon the tongue of his messenger, like he did Salah, Zakah, Som and Hajj. Lippam mentioned, The political establishment of power. There is a political establishment of Islam which is political by nature, 
power is something that is seized once a legitimate authority exists. The Sunnah nowhere advocates for the seizing of power. The Messenger ﷺ seized opportunities, but never power. He was invited and welcomed into Medina peacefully. Abu Bakr peacefully ascended to the leadership of the Ummah after the Messenger ﷺ. Abu Bakr peacefully handed rule over to Umar before his own death. Before his soul departed the earth, Umar delegated a six-man council who peacefully elected Uthman. Ali was then elected, kind of by default, following Uthman's murder. Hassan bin Ali then inherited the Khilafah following the murder of his father. He seized nothing. None of them did. Finally, Hassan peacefully abdicated in favor of Muawiyah. And thus ended the Khilafah Rashidun, as the Prophet ﷺ foretold. خِلَافَةُ النَّبُوَّةِ ثَلَاثُونَ سَنَّةِ ثُمَّ يُتِّيَ اللَّهُ وَالْمُلْكَ مَنْ يَشَاءُ The Prophetic Caliphate will last 30 years. Then Allah will grant kingship to whomsoever he wills. The narrator of this hadith, Safina, a servant of the Messenger of Allah, said, Take not Abu Bakr, 2 years, Umar, 10 years, Uthman, 12 years, and Ali as was. And when the Mahdi re-establishes the Khilafah upon the prophetic methodology, it will also be peacefully. He will seize nothing. So do not superimpose your lust for power upon the best of this Ummah. Behave. Don't confuse Mohammedanism for Marxist-Leninism. Keep your violent, violent communist coup cravings to yourselves. Ibn Hajr al-Asqalani said, then things started to decline in all regions of the Muslim world to the point that there was nothing left of the caliphate except the name only in some countries. This statement is not akin to there being no caliphate at all in all lands. That's right. It was the Prophet ﷺ, not Ibn Hajr, who foretold of the Khilafah lasting only 30 years. And it was the Prophet who foretold that the Mahdi will re-establish it. In between that time, what you have is kingship. The Mambiks could not inherit Khilafah from the Ayyubids because the Khilafah was with the Abbasids in 1250. HD Canada had claimed, And if there were any times where there was a Khalifa who died or there was a huge amount of turmoil like the Mongols and so on, if you were to bring a Khalifa and put him back in power, would the Khilafah structure still be in place? And the answer was always yes. So I asked if this is so, and the nominal Abbasid Caliphate which was confined to Iraq ended in 1258, from whom did the Mamluks inherit the Khilafah? In which Khalifal system did the Kairin Caliphate continue? When the Ayyubid lands they took over hadn't been ruled by even a nominal Caliph in hundreds of years. So either you acknowledge this, in which case HT Britain and Australia refute the false claims of HT Canada, or you agree with HT Canada, in which case you'd both be admitting that the Caliphate, as ineffective as it was, came to an end in the mid 13th century at the very latest. As for Caliph Salim, he took the oath of allegiance from the Arlel Heli Wall Act of Mecca and Medina to ascend to the position of Khalifa. Sultan Salim II didn't even pretend to be a Caliph. What are you chatting? It was only in the reign of his son, Suleiman the Magnificent, that the idea of an Ottoman Sultan as Caliph started floating around. But as said, the Ottomans didn't really care for the title, besides it being against their Maturidi creed. Speaking of Salim, how do HT justify his war upon the Abbasid Shadow Caliphate? The pretext Salim used was that the Mamluks did not join him in his war against the Safavids, whom the Ottomans had declared disbelievers for being Shia. HT's official position on the Shia is that they are part of the saved sect. So either you support Salim's blanket takfir and war against the Shia, in which case you've opposed the HT party line, as well as endorsed war against the Caliphate, or you believe the Ottomans were oppressive. Caliphate killing takfiris who did not judge by what Allah revealed. So which is it? Answers on a postcard. Address 786, no postal service without a Khilafa street, Dar al Kufr, because everywhere but the Khilafa is Dar al Kufr. Postcode HT 1924. Why is Abdur Rahman referring to Istanbul as Constantinople? Constantinople, Arabic, Constantinia is how Allah's Messenger referred to the city. If you are thinking the name Istanbul has some Islamic connotation, you'd be wrong. It derives from the Greek Istinpolis, to the city. Like Edirne is a shortened, Turkified form of Adrianople. 
The city was officially referred to as Constantiniya for the entirety of the Ottoman state. It was not dropped for Istanbul until the 1930s as Mustafa Kemal wanted to break from the city's Ottoman Islamic past. Check out our video Constantinople and the Sunnah in the Ottoman Autopsy playlist. He goes on to misinterpret sayings of Rasulullah, implying that conquered territories were not ruled by Islam, and brings the pathetic example of coinage to back his ridiculous claims. Are you special? The opposite point was being made. All Islamic states appropriated Byzantine, Sasanian, and other such customs of the conquered peoples. And this is not a problem provided you remain within the overall objectives of the Sharia and do not oppose the Sunnah. Refer to our video, Enter the Sunnah, in the Civilization playlist. Ironically, what Hijtiya adamant was the Khilafah system until 1924 was actually a violation of the Sunnah. How did the noble companion, Abdurrahman, son of the noble companion, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, radiallahu anhumah, object to the imposition of Yazid over the Muslims? He protested to Yazid's governor, Marwan bin al-Hakam, Ala wa inna ma aradtum an taj'alunaha qaysariya. Nay, you only want to make the Khilafah into a Caesarism. Kullama mata qaysaru kana qaysar. Whenever one Caesar would die, another Caesar would take his place. And when Marwan said that it was the son of Abdurrahman's father, Abu Bakr, and that of his successor, Umar ibn al-Khattab, to pass on succession in such a way, Abdurrahman countered, Sunnah to Hirqal wa Qaysar. Rather, it is the Sunnah of Heraclius and Caesar. So said the brother of our mother, Aisha, the son of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, who was the first caliph of Islam and the best of the Muslims after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what did Umar have to say, the next best believer and second caliph of Islam, about the system of the Khilafah? Whoever pledges allegiance to somebody without consulting the other Muslims, then neither the one giving the pledge nor the one receiving it should be granted allegiance, lest the both of them are killed. Hence the Islamic Caliphate lasted only 30 years as the Prophet foretold it would. After that we had monarchy, dynastic succession, as the Prophet foretold we would. The Sufyanids and Marwanids of Banu Umayyah and after them the Abbasids till the Ottomans all of them practiced Caesarism, which was often imposed upon the Ummah by the most brutal of means. Only the successions of the Khulafa al-Rashidun accorded to the Sunnah of the Prophet in totality. They alone did not co-modify the Khilafah with the Sunnah of the disbelievers. Hence they were described as such, as rightly guided. فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِسُنَّةِ وَسُنَّةِ Khulafa al-Rashidin al Mahdiin min ba'di Therefore, upon you is my Sunnah, commanded the Prophet, and the Sunnah of the rightly guided Caliphs after me. He وسلم, did not praise the Sunnah of any ruler after them, although any good they did would naturally fall under his overall praise, as well as Allah's good pleasure. As for discussing epochs of what Abdurrahman describes as global Caliphs, as opposed to one of many a localized Caliph, it is history and not a source of law. When it comes to history, when HT rank and file are confronted with the lies that the party has nurtured them upon for so long, they don't know how to react. They go into full denial mode and project their days and confusion on the rest of us, as if we're suggesting that history abrogates the sunnah. Whoever pledges to an imam, giving him his handshake and the fruit of his heart, should obey him as much as he can. If another comes to dispute him, strike the neck of the other. We've already covered this genre of hadith in volume 3. The Prophet ﷺ was talking about sedition, when an internal challenge is made against the Imam behind whom the Ummah is united. The Hadith do not invalidate non-Khalifal Islamic states. Political unity irrevocably ceased barely a century after the Prophet's passing ﷺ. Yet the Ummah continued to advance, states continued to flourish, and rulers continued to be obeyed. Why? Because, unlike HT, the Ummah at large don't suspend Islam in the absence of a mythological unitary caliphate. Essentially, HT are arguing that throughout history, the reality of multiple Islamic states contradicted the Hadith, while we've been explaining to them that the multiplicity of stable and flourishing Islamic states demonstrate how such Hadith were applied locally, 
No scholar enjoined the forceful unification of states because the sunnah of political unity does not take precedence over the prohibition of war between Muslims. This is something the Ahl sunnah have reached consensus on. Besides, you think if Allah in his infinite wisdom denied the likes of Ali and Abdullah ibn Zubair uncontested caliphal powers that he will grant it to you jokers of HT, no less through a communist inspired revolution? And not with all your corrupt and innovated creed? Give us a break. As for the Ofmani Russo Treaty, I read the articles and found no mention of the Khalifa being the spiritual head of the Ummah. One may question why the Ottomans would push such a concept when in practice the Khalifa was a political head. How dense does one have to be to argue on behalf of HT? I explained why they pushed the concept, and I'm inclined to ask you to go back and re-watch that video. But it's evident HT cheerleaders suffer some kind of mental block when it comes to evidences that challenge their worldview and Khilafa mythology. Like failing to understand that large objects appear small when far away. Okay, one last time. These are small, but the ones out there are far away. <laughs> Small, far away. <laughs> I forget it. He then went on to repeat Kemalist propaganda that was used in the past to create public opinion for the abolishment of the Khilafah by accusing the Ofmani Khilafah of becoming an enemy servant institute. Note how they would never say this about Saudi Arabia. If the Saudis claim to be caliphs or to be working towards the establishment of a caliphate, we'd refute that falsehood. But they ain't claiming that, are they? What you had during the Turkish War of Independence following World War I was Kemal's nationalist forces on one side and on the other, the official Khalifal army supported by the occupying Western Allied armies. The very same Westerners who carved up the Near East under Sykes-Pico before they established the Zionist entity in Palestine. And before buttressing the British bombardiers, the Caliph was doing the Kaiser's bidding. Even Islam-hating Turkish apostates recognize this reality and the role played by one of their own. So should you not too? The Ottoman rulers under occupation signed the treaties of their defeat, but Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, who was a very successful and influential commander in the Ottoman army, started a new movement against this defeat of the Ottoman Empire. Ataturk led Turkey through what is known as the Turkish War of Independence. Turkey's claimed land, what remained from the Ottoman Empire, was occupied by Greece, France, the UK and Armenia. The Turkish nationalists decisively won this war, expelled the occupying forces, drove out the Ottoman government and went on to form a new nation. Sorry to burst your bubble, but it is what it was. Such insults in this case, lies are only saved for speaking out against any conception of a Khilafah. Now now, be fair, be honest, we are only speaking out against HT's ahistoric, innovated conception of the Khilafah. We are wholly in favor of the Islamic Khilafah. Also, referring to the Uthmanis as an empire is a mistake. The ruled territories were multi-ethnic, multi-racial and multilingual, and the laws applied equally on people, regardless of ethnicity or race. I don't know of an empire except that it ruled over multi-ethnic, multi-racial and multilingual territories. That's kind of what defines an empire. As for laws being applied equally on all subject groups, that's neither accurate nor even desirable in all cases. When it came to the Ottomans, like Muslim empires before them, certain ethnicities were granted special dispensation which allowed them to dominate certain sectors of economy and society. In some cases, this led to a disincentive to convert to Islam, due to a perceived loss of privilege. Unless we forget, for most of the Janissary Corps' existence, boy slaves were taken exclusively from Balkan Christian communities, while for a long while, Muslim women from the North Caucasus were the preferred source for female slaves. Both of these practices were Sharia violations, even if the locals aided and abetted them. But then, in Heshti's mythology, caliphates ruled only by the Sharia. HT end by claiming that we won't entertain dialogue with their members. This is untrue. But more than that, it's a ruse. HT's deviation is in the public domain, 
So those of us who feel able are obliged to refute them in public and clarify the sunnah for the benefit of the public. If HT want private discussion as well, they're most welcome. But as I've been saying from the beginning, it's best wait till this playlist is finished as I want to give them the benefit of first seeing the full weight of evidence against them. I'm trying to do you guys a favour. Though to be perfectly honest, judging by the comments I'm answering here, we'll only be giving HT more rope with which to hang themselves. Metaphorically speaking, of course. والذين اتخذوا مسجدا ضرارا وكفرا وتفريقا بين المؤمنين وإرصادا لمن حارب الله ورسوله من قبل ولا يحلفن إن أردنا إلا الحسن والله يشهد إنهم لكاذبون لا تقم فيه أبدا لمسجد أسس على التقوى من أول يوم أحق أن تقوم فيه فيه رجال يحبون أن يتطهروا والله يحب المطهرين أفمن أسس بنيانه على تقوى من الله ورضوان خير أم من أسس بنيانه على شفا جرف هار فانهار به في نار جهنم والله لا يهدي القوم الظالمين لا يزال بنيانهم الذي بنوا ريبة في قلوبهم إلا أن تقطع قلوبهم والله عليم حكيم